Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for one event in our conversations series. So what we're doing in these conversations is, um, I am Lauren Barron's father, I'm director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, and I am bringing conversations that I get to have usually behind the scenes to light so that everyone can learn from the amazing people that I get to talk to in my role. So um, you may know that the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh is deeply engaged with communities throughout the city of Pittsburgh and the region of southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, today I am speaking with Pastor Tim Smith. Tim Smith is the CEO of Center of Life and pastor of the Keystone Church of Hazelwood. He's been working with children and youth for over 25 years. Tim was born and raised in Pittsburgh and educated in the Pittsburgh public schools. He's a graduate of Westinghouse High School and holds degrees from Triangle Tech, the University of Pittsburgh, the Leadership Training Institute, the American Institute of Banking, as well as a diploma from the Reformed Theological Seminary. Quite a list. Um, Tim has dedicated his life to empowering families and youth everywhere. And over the past four or so years, the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh has worked closely with the Center of Life in Hazelwood and I just wanna say, leading into this conversation, that Pastor Tim Smith has been a spiritual guide for me in a way that transcends religious beliefs. So um, I see in my work with Tim Smith and with Center of Life, all of the things that we have in common as human beings and the potential we have to work together really to bring good to society. So I am so happy you're with me today, thank you. It's good to be here, it's good to see you, Lauren. <laughs> it's great to see you as always, and uh, I thought we could start by talking a little bit about the work that we did together to begin with, um, and that goes back to your history in Hazelwood. So can you tell people who are tuning in a bit about Hazelwood for people who are not familiar with this wonderful neighborhood? Yeah, Hazelwood is, you know, I always tell people whenever you come to Hazelwood, uh, uh, you're not in Kansas anymore, you're, you know? <laughs> It's like the Wizard of Oz. It's like you, you, you cross over a certain place and you're in a whole different sphere of living. Um, but great people in Hazelwood. Uh, you know, I lived in Hazelwood for several years uh, before my wife and I found a home. Uh, and, um, you know, we raised our kids there. Our kids went to Head, head Start in Hazelwood down at the uh, Three Rivers uh, Indian uh, Head Start down there. And, uh, you know, we, we, we live there. We, we're part of the community and we're still a part of the community and, and, and all the work that we do through our church and everything else. Um, it's a population of almost almost half and half, uh, you know, half African-American, half white. But then, you know, I get into more of the ethnic groups that are in the community. Like we have Philippines that live here, percentage of Philippines, percent, uh, percentage of Native Americans, Italians. Hungarians, you know, um, we have Asian, uh, really a newer population of Asian folks that are, are, have been moving in as well. Uh, so we've got a fairly, I think we have probably one of the most diverse communities in the city. Yeah. And I'll say just a little bit about where Hazelwood is. Um, people probably know, but maybe not because the way Pittsburgh is, people stay in their own neighborhoods and even across Western Southwestern Pennsylvania, and people stay where they are. I'm from McKeesport, as you know. A lot of people, when I was growing up in McKeesport and White Oak, did not leave those parts of town, even though Pittsburgh is very close. So um, the Holocaust Center is located right now in Greenfield, which is adjacent to Squirrel Hill and also adjacent to Hazelwood. So um, when I started as director of the Holocaust Center, I said, what neighborhood is down there? Our location is on Hazelwood Avenue. And it was an opportunity for us to get involved with this community. Um, it's a community that um, definitely suffered when the mills closed. And that's also part of the story of Hazelwood. So um, we met when I was connected to you by Avi Monroe from Community Day School uh, mm -hmm. because of a project you wanted to do in Hazelwood. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we, 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 uh, we met around that, so I can I can even go back even further. You know, my wife and I, uh, my wife Donna, we were walking through Squirrel Hill one day, and um, <clears throat> we we came upon this exhibit that was right. I didn't I didn't even know the name of the school that it was next to, but it turned out that it was the Community Day School, 
And, and the exhibit was called Keeping Tabs. And we went in through that exhibit and we were looking at that. And it was, it all looked like it was, it was glass block, but it was uh, silver. We saw a lot of silver in there. And then we got up close on it. And as we got up close, we, we noticed that they were like the, the, the tabs from the uh, cans, pop cans. And, um, and most of them were silver, but then when we, we started looking real close, we saw blue and red and yellow and uh, green. And, and then once we saw all those colors, it seemed like we could see all of the, all of the tabs. It seemed like something opened up for us. And we began to read the different inscriptions that were there. And we said to ourselves, you know, this is, it was just really like a spiritual moment for us because we were thinking about the 6 million, you know, Jews that went through that, that horrific, uh, really words can't describe the kind of things that they went through. Uh, and, we, and, and how, somebody we didn't know at the time how somebody said you know we need to honor them in some kind of way so it wasn't like there were faces there it wasn't like there were you know any of those kinds of things but it was it was can tabs you know and and so it's called and the thing is called keeping tabs right but even though you're looking at those tabs when you go in there and you realize what it is <clears throat> you realize each one of those tabs is a person each one of those tabs is a face a family you know, uh, and, and that really hit us, you know, as we said, boy, after what we've been through in this city and in and, and Hazelwood in particular, uh, we thought we would, we wanted to do something to recognize the kids that we've had to bury over the years in that community. And so, you know, we started thinking about it and I, um, I called, um, Andy Fishhoff. So Andy Fishhoff used to be the, uh, she did the development for um, family resources at one time. And she had been a uh, volunteer with Center of Life for now, oh my goodness, probably six years, maybe seven years, um, where she's been working with us and, and helping us with all kinds of things and, and connecting us. Andy is, is a major connector and uh, a resource guru and just, just smart and, and a beautiful person. Yes, she so is. she, um, she connected, she connected us to Avi, and we okay. went. We met with Avi. Yep. And then Avi uh, told us the story of you know the uh, the keeping tabs exhibit, and then I think it was Avi that told us about you. Avi told us about Lauren Barron's father, who was over at. <laughs> The, the the Holocaust Center, we were like, Holocaust Center, where's the Holocaust Center is that? And, it, and she said, it's like on Hazelwood Avenue, so, you know? So we were like, man, we didn't even know. So Zabi so got us hooked in with you. And then that's when we came together. And uh, and, and that to me is, is, that's a powerful journey for me because um, what led to all of this is I've, I've, I've been in Hazelwood for quite a, a long time. <laughs> um, I work with a lot of kids in the community and, um, and a lot of families, but I've had to bury a lot of kids uh, because of maybe some gun violence or some kind of violence. I had, to, I, I had to do their funerals. I had to eulogize them. And it got to the place where I was burying so many kids that I, I lost track lost track of the number and um and and i think i at some point i just started doing it as if it was like my duty to do it you know and i guess some people might think that sounds noble or something but like for me it, it wasn't it was a bit morbid for me because i'm like wait a minute you know these kids are i'm burying kids that are younger than me you know they're they're so much younger and I'm burying babies and they should be burying me. Mm -hmm. And so um, we started thinking about how can we, uh, how can we get together and do something to pay tribute to these lives who had tons of potential, but very little opportunity, very little opportunity, very little access to, to 
resources and technology and information that they would need in order to do what they needed to do. Their education, you know, wasn't great. Um, there were no schools in the community at all. Um, and so a lot of the resources that the schools would bring weren't in our community. Um, so there's just so many things that were missing. Uh, and um, I probably at one point was doing a funeral every four weeks or so, you know? And so, uh, and, and, you know, I, um, to this day, there are kids that I, I know that came up in some of our programs that I don't remember if I buried them or not. Like, I don't know. And, and it's, it's, it's hard because sometimes I'll go back and I'll look at videos of kids that were in our programs growing up and, and I'll forget that, and it'll come to me while I'm watching the video that, you know, that's a kid that, you know, you buried. So, you know, you will never see this kid again alive. And, and that's the kind of thing that struck me is that, you know, I can't, it can't be normal for me to do this. And so I really, uh, I decided I didn't want to do any more funerals, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to do something to pay, you know, tribute to these kids, these lives. I wasn't, I wasn't celebrating them as heroes or criminals. I was just celebrating and recognizing that the fact that they live, they and that life alone is supposed to be precious for us. And um, so that's when, you know, Andy, you know, brought me up to, to see you and, and, and to see the Holocaust Center. So after seeing Keeping Tabs and then coming over and seeing the Holocaust Center and how you all had that set up and how you all curated the, those artifacts and all the different things that you all had, the people, the pictures. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that really impacted me the most, you know, it's hard to really pick one thing that impacted me the most about the center. But there were two things. I'll say two things. One was um, Sam Goddesman, the Holocaust survivor, his story, mm -hmm. uh, him talking to my staff, yes. him spending time with us to tell his story. It was so impacting. I mean, I don't know if there was a dry eye in the place that day. And... Um, and his, his willingness to tell that story and his and the way he articulated it and and then the way it kind of culminated in I had asked a question, I asked him, I said, you know, given all that you've been through, you know, how is your, you know, how do you how do you see God after all, you know? Right. And um and his answers were just so it was so the one answer I was thinking about his faith. I was thinking about faith. I think the 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 it had more to do with faith, the question. And he said, the, really, the, the, his answer, answer kind of came out to be, you know, we can't be overcome with evil, but we have to overcome evil with good. And then he talked about the fact that the Jews were chosen for that. You know, like, like he, he made it into a bigger picture, that mm -hmm. it wasn't just a matter of the Jewish people, but it was a bigger, a bigger picture. And that stuck with me, you know, that stuck with me uh, to say that, you know, there's, you know, everything counts. There's a reason for everything. And um, the other thing that was extremely impacting for me was when you all uh, had in the one section, you had a uniform from uh, one of the, you know, concentration camps uh, and, um, and I remember going in there and standing in front of that and I couldn't move. Like I, I was like kind of stuck thinking there was somebody wore that. There was a person in that uniform and they, they didn't make it, you know? And, um, and, and it made me, and, and I, and between that and Sam, I was thinking about Sam's family when, when they told Sam everything was going to be okay. And him and his dad had to go one way and the other parts of his family had to go another way and they showed him the smoke. These are things that I'll never forget. Like they showed him the smoke and he said, they said, that's where your family's going to be and they're going to be okay. And, and uh, you know, that's some crazy stuff. And to me, it, it harkens so much to where we are today. It's like the, 
the corruption and the denial and the, you know, the stuff that I'm seeing, you know, and I've been seeing it for a long time and we've been screaming it, and we meaning African-Americans, been screaming it for a long time that there's every, everything is wrong here. It's just wrong. You know, um, you know, the, the, the laws are wrong. The system is not broken. The system is not rigged. It's just wrong. And it needs to be reformed. It needs to be fixed or not fixed, but reformed, you know? And, um, and so, you know, going, going up to the Holocaust center for my staff and for myself also has just been a part of the journey. And so we began to meet with Carnegie Mellon University about doing this. So you all became one of our consultants. Avi Monroe was one of our consultants. Right. Andy Fishoff was was the really the <laughs> she's the one that kind of got the connector. Whole started. Yeah. yeah. And um, um and we 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 hooked up with uh Kristen uh Hughes and Dylan Vatone uh and Charlie Humphreys uh and we put and, and Terry uh, Irwin, who was the head of the, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, I think this was the design school. Yeah, Terry Irwin was the, the head of the design school, and we and and so I became an adjunct professor to work with Kristen and Dylan to to put together this exhibit that we that we that we uh, that we did in Hazelwood, and it was called "I Lived, We Live." What did we miss? And really, Kristen, Kristen Hughes came up with that that title. You know, we we had sat down for the longest time. We were talking about what it should be called and different things like that. And Kristen sent out an email, and she had that in there. And um, and she wasn't forcing it on us, but she you know she put it out there. And uh, and I said, man, that's that's perfect. You know, that's perfect because th those are those three. Three sort of little statements are three things that make you think, you know, like I lived represented the people who lived but did not, that were not, weren't not still with us. I, we live was talking about us. And then what did we miss is also talking about us, you know, and, and also is talking about the ones who, you know, were gone before us. And um, so that the class that we put together, uh, it was they had about 33 students they were all international mostly international students i think 60 percent were international students and um, mostly asian students you know uh there were i think it was one black student in the in the uh in the class and there was i know there was a latino student in the class and then a few white students and um and we you know we brought in people to speak to them. I think you spoke with the class. You spoke to the class. Yes. And they, they came up to the uh, Holocaust Center. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, they, and, you know, they got a lot of their ideas from the Holocaust Center, you know, and, uh, and from the Keeping Tabs and, you know, just really doing, doing the research that they were doing. And, um, and it wasn't, you know, it, it was a, uh, you know, it was, we hooked up, we, we brought together about 28 parents in, from Hazelwood. Yes. Uh, most of which had lost kids to some kind of violence. And, um, and we brought the two worlds together. So the, the class from CMU and the, and the parents from Hazelwood. And they, the first thing they did when they came together was they told their personal stories to each other. And that was really great because it was interesting to, to see some of the similarities in some of the countries that some of the students came from, but what they actually deal with and, and finding that, you know, in some cases, color was not an issue because everybody was the same color. And in some cases where there was a difference in shades, <laughs> there was a problem, <laughs> you know, and um, it was just interesting talking about all that. And over time, as we continued the class, the class would be part of half half the class was held in Hazelwood and half of it was held uh, in um, on on campus and uh, the students you know got to know the people in Hazelwood they all got to know each other they learned I mean every I mean really was a kind of a nice situation because Hazelwood people really embraced them and they told them told their story and they were um, 
teaching them how to cook soul food and you know all kind you know all kinds of stuff went down you know but i took uh, i took the students on a tour of hazelwood or a couple tours of hazelwood so they could see the hazelwood green site i gave them the background of the community and where we'd been and where we were trying to go and then the whole point of the kids that we had to bury and, and you know the laws and how that worked and so um um yeah and then and then it just you know it just began to take form it began to take shape uh until finally we got to the day where we would um you know open up uh open up the exhibit and that was a uh, that was quite a day but you know uh the, you know the first person if i'm not mistaken the first person to actually come into the exhibit after we put it up was sam so I sam, brought sam yes you brought sam yes you brought sam down to the exhibit nobody else had been to the exhibit before that and we have a picture of you and sam and then we also have a picture of sam and a little kid that was yes. in there uh and sam is talking to the kid and um you know that's one for the ages you know just this little it black is. kid little black kid and sam this guy this jewish guy that went through the holocaust and uh i'm like that's a story that's a song it's a video it's a movie it's there's a lot to this you know it's i mean it is all of those things and i i just want to say that um, for me, as head of the Holocaust Center, the day that you came and brought your staff and families from Hazelwood, people who, who lost brothers and sons, that day showed me what's possible because I believed, I really believed strongly, mostly in my heart and not in my mind, that this worked, that there was a connection that was going to happen. And that day we saw it. And, and it even... It's a line that continues from that day through you're talking about the students from CMU talking to people from Hazelwood, that when we share our stories, we connect as human beings. Yeah. And we connect beyond things like the color of our skin. Yeah. So it's when I said that you've been a spiritual guide to me, you have been because you have shown me what's possible in these conversations with the openness that you have brought to our programs with the openness of everyone in Hazelwood. And I really can't overstate the warmth of this community. I mean, if I go there now and walk down the street, I'm going to know 20 people yeah. and they will welcome me like I'm a family member. That's right. And, That's right. and you can't really put into words what that experience feels like, but there's, there is such a connection and it's an incredible community. So the exhibit opened in Hazelwood at the Keystone Church. It has been at the Jewish Community Center. It has been at the August Wilson Center. It's traveled around. It's equal parts the stories of these boys who were lost and history of Hazelwood. So a history of Hazelwood that's been lost. And it really was an incredible triumph. So I want to congratulate you for that and those students and your partners at CMU and everyone who came together to make it happen. I know when I stepped into the church and saw it for the first time, I was speechless, which rarely happens to me. I mean, I had no words. It was just so gorgeous and moving and heartfelt and an important memorial to all of those boys. You know, people from 12 different countries came to see the exhibit and that, uh, that blew me away. I was doing the final, I remember the final group that, that came was from New Zealand. And, uh, and we didn't know, we didn't even know how they were finding out about the, you know, about the exhibit, but just thousands of people came to see the exhibit and it was it was it was so good for me to see this because I always wanted people to come and experience Hazelwood. I always want to bring people to Hazelwood. I think I brought a lot of people to Hazelwood. You know? um, but when they come to Hazelwood, they ex they experience the people that you talk about. You know, mm -hmm. you know they experience the 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 friendliness of this of this community and the diversity and, and everything else. You know, we've got. They're just great. I call this the University of Hazelwood. I really do. And uh, I'm still a student, mm -hmm. you know, don't know if I'll ever graduate, you know? <laughs> but um, it's a great place to live and to work you know, and to play. So what is happening in Hazelwood now? We're in the COVID era and I'm just wondering how that has affected the fine people of Hazelwood, how that has affected the work of the Center of Life. Yeah, it, it, it has impacted us uh, quite quite a bit. Um, 
um, we, we, as, as we were continuing to keep up with the news from the CDC and the health department and everything else, we saw very early uh, that we were going to need to start pivoting in terms of the way we provided service to the community. And one of the main things that we knew we needed to do was to make sure that people got their essentials, got the essentials. So we called a meeting uh, with the Greater Hazelwood Community Collaborative, with members of the Greater Hazelwood Community Collaborative. And Terry Shields is uh, the chair of that, of, 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 the, of the organization. Mm -hmm. And um, we started talking about things that really needed to be done. And we started organizing and, and saying, you know, we know we're going to need to start delivering food and we need to handle, you know, all the things that we needed to, that we knew were going to be essential uh, things for people that people were going to need. We said, uh, we better, we better start coordinating that now. So uh, we're, we're, we've always been a part of the food bank. So we were able to, get, you know, get food and the P PPS, Pittsburgh Public Schools chose us to be a site where they would deliver food so the food could be distributed. We, we hooked up with uh, Pittsburgh Community Kitchen. Uh, there was two other groups, uh, um, the Praise Temple Church in Hazelwood and the Poor Law in Hazelwood that also delivered food as well. And um, Pittsburgh Community Kitchen delivered food uh, for dinner. So uh, we were doing breakfast and lunch and Pittsburgh Community Kitchen was doing dinners. And um, I think when we started out, I think it was maybe between 500 and 800 meals a week. Um, and by week, week two or three, I think it was week three, we were doing over 2000 meals a week. And then by probably by week four or five, we were doing uh, over 5,000 meals a week. And so, uh, and, and, and then, and that did not include, you know, the toiletries and paper products and cleaning products um, and masks and gloves and all those things. And we've kept a record of all those things, you know, just to, just to show, you know, what the need, how much the need was there, you know. And, yeah, so, uh, so let me ask you, I mean, why couldn't people get food? I mean, what's the situation? What, what are the obstacles and barriers to getting food? Yeah, well, initially, initially the, uh, the barriers were the stores were closing. Uh, so once we went into red, the stores were closing, and then also the shelves were, were not full anymore. So you'd go to a store, and it was, it was, it was slim pickings, you know, at the store. So um, we, you know, we worked with the food bank. We worked with... Pittsburgh Public Schools and other uh, food service providers to try to get food plus some of these other things into the community so that we could get them to the homes. The idea was was to keep people off the streets. Um, at the time, you know, we were dealing with some fairly high numbers, and you know, Hazelwood has the highest number in city proper in Pittsburgh city proper. Hazelwood had the highest number of COVID cases and COVID deaths. So, so uh, Glen Hazel actually, the Glen Hazel section of Hazelwood. So um, our, our job was to, you know, get the meals, organize it, you know, put everything together and get out there and uh, deliver them. So we would, we would, you know, drop the meals on the porch, ring the bell, and we would, we would leave because, you know, you couldn't have a lot of contact with people. Um, so we, we've been doing that since we've been doing that ever since we went into red, um, we're still, we're still delivering, we're still delivering food. <laughs> you know? And, um, and, but in the process, what we also found is we're going to people's homes and some of the homes that we, we would go to really needed to be fixed up. Uh, different things needed to happen. Um, I, I remember going up a set of steps that were so brittle and crumbled. Uh, no railings, nothing. And I, I, it was almost like I was climbing a mountain. When I got to the top of the steps, you know, and I knocked on the door and I had the food, um, the lady that came to the, to, the, to the door 
was disabled. So I'm like, how do you get, you know, how do you get up these steps? Do you ever leave this house? Those, all those questions came to mind. And so we, we have uh, social workers here and, and people who uh, work through COL, but we also have other people in the community that work with community people as well. And so we put together, we had already been putting together a thing that we call the Hazelwood Healthy Life. And we, we got that group together to talk about what we were seeing as we're delivering food. We're, we're deli delivering food to places that really do need home modifications, but people don't have the money to do it. And also, you have, you have people living in places that people who are slumlords own. And so they won't fix the place or they can't fix the place. So what, we're try what we've been trying to do is, is work with landlords to see if we can help them get the funding to fix up their places. And, and in the process, we've been, able to, we've been able to find those kinds of things through uh, state and local funding. Uh, we've, we've had uh, contractors that have donated their time to help people fix their homes you know, get, get things done. I mean, that, you know, all that stuff speaks to how the human part of us is just standing up. You know, the human part uh, of people is standing up everywhere, everywhere. Just so many people just saying, what can we do? How can we help? And I want to, I want to say something that I think really needs to be said and probably in this situation is not said enough, but the foundation community stepped up big time in my opinion yeah. i had i had foundation people calling me lauren to see how i was doing they were calling me to see how i was doing it wasn't like you know how's your programs how's your organization you know although they called me to see how i was doing that means everything yes you know when you're working every day and you're working hard you know, when people call you, if the, all they want to know about is the work that you're doing. You know, it, it, it's kind of a dry connect, you know, but, but when they ask about you and your family, you know, again, it's that human part of us that's standing up, you know, and it's the, that intangible, that invisible spirit that reaches out to that other, that other spirit. And um, so and then, and then they would say, you know, hey, listen, we want to help. And so there's, they put together a, a, a cohort of uh, folks, uh, of foundations that began to provide COVID-19 funding for us. That was huge. Mm -hmm. That was huge, you know. And I don't take any of those things for granted because I think sometimes foundations get a bad rap. And they're not perfect, just like we're not perfect. But I think that at this particular point, they stood up. And, um, and they reached out and they weren't just reaching out to say, what are you doing? They reached out to say, how are you doing? You know, and how can we help? And so it wasn't, they didn't reach out to say, here's what you need to do. They reached out to say, here, we have funding and we're willing to follow your lead. And that is major. That's important. You know, and so I, I just wanted to give that shout out to, to the foundation community. I'm glad that you said that, but it's our experience too. And I mean, what people outside of Pittsburgh m might not have in their own cities, and I think it's pretty rare and special here, is a foundation community that is really responsive to what's happening and what the needs are. And this is a time of really great, unusual need, you know, that requires a different kind of thinking. And absolutely, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, we've, al we've also been very generously supported um, through this time because organizations like ours, many have many probably won't be able to stay open. Right, right. So um, foundations have stepped up to make it possible for us to stay active and doing what we're doing. And in fact, these conversations we're recording. Um, we had very nice funding from Heinz, where we work with Michelle Figler, who is from Hazelwood. Yeah. So it all, yeah. all connects back. Yeah. So, um, so yes, but I'm glad you said that. Thank you. Um, I want us to talk about something else that's also of this moment. We are now past a month. We've had more than a month of protests after the murder of George Floyd and a lot of activity around Black Lives Matter. I want to hear from you what your thoughts are about this moment. And I'm, I'm wanting to hear from you your general thoughts, but also do you feel like we have an opportunity now 
um, to do something that we have not been able to do before. And um, for the reason that I'm asking about this and why this is important for the Holocaust Center to ask, because I always want to establish, you know, why is the Holocaust Center having this conversation? We're guided by history. And when we look at what's happening in this country, we are looking at a 400 year history. And now that, that is front and center now. This is not political. This is history. Do we have an opportunity now to right history's wrongs? Yeah, I think the, I think in addition to that question, the question is, do we have the will? Because um, we have to, we have to have the will to do it. The opportunity has existed for many years. Uh, the will, it just wasn't there. Um, and so when we know, um, when we know that there are so many things that are untrue about our country that we continue to allow to stay in place. Um, you have so many, you have generations of black children who, including myself, that were not privilege to learn about our own history. We had to go and seek it out. We had to figure it out. You know, we had to find people. They wouldn't even hire people that would teach black history in public schools, you know? Um, but now all of these things is coming up out, you know, as a result of technology, as a result of, of, of black people who have gone to school, have done their research, you know, gone out and they, they, they've learned the truth about, about our country. And um, not that, you know, Native Americans haven't been screaming it for, for the longest time. Native Americans have, you know, part, I am part Native American myself. And so, um, so I know, you know, and um, so I, I think that we've always had an opportunity, um, but the will is not, is not there. And, and, when, and part of that has to do with the conditioning of the human condition what what each one of us is exposed to when we first when we're first born is our family you know everything starts at home and if you are conditioned to think a certain way about a certain people who are a certain color or a certain size or a certain whatever you know height or whatever then that's going to follow you uh, into, your, into your adulthood. And it's going to impact every area of your life. Um, you know, I, I used to work with people when I was an investment banker. I used to work with people who believed that if they shook my hand, that they would turn black. And, and I thought, how can, you be, how can you be thinking like that? That means I must... That means I'm going to turn white. If you know, if you're going to turn black, then I'm going to turn white. So, you know, it, it. You know, you hear stuff like that, and you wonder how in the world could people condition their children to believe that? But I'm saying adults. I met adults <clears throat> that really believe, and there are adults today who still believe that. There are adults today who believe that black people are black because we're cursed. Not because we were the first people created, you know, on earth. Not because every human being comes from a person of color, you know. They, they don't know. They just don't know. And so, um, you know, there's so much that really needs to happen. So when people right now, you know, we have the people that are concerned about statues that are being torn down of people who were racist and people who did heinous crimes against humanity. Um, but those statues are not just a memorial, they're a celebration of those people. And they must be taken down, absolutely positively. They should not stand uh, in a public place. You can put them in a private place and, and, and teach people what not to do, you know? <laughs> But not in a public square, not in a public place, I don't think, you know. Uh, and as much as I love art, you know, uh, I am not for celebrating these figures that did uh, these heinous crimes and, 
you know, when you, when you think about, when you think about Germany and you think, where are the statues of Hitler? You know, where are those statues? And, and some of the other ones that, you know, did just did heinous crimes against humanity. Nobody wants to see statues of them standing up, you know? And, right, and uh, there, there are none in case people who are listening don't know, there are no statues like that yeah, in Germany and yeah. it's illegal to fly a Nazi flag. And, yeah. 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 And and that's interesting. And so, so, so where, where we are right now, I think we do have an opportunity. And I think that this feels very different from other uh, rallies and, and protests that I've seen or been a part, you know, of, um, this feels very different. I'm so glad to see all of the young people and and the diversity that's out there. Uh, you know, I feel very um, encouraged by the fact that Black people have stepped out and said, you know what, we're not going to go back to our homes. We're not going to stop marching until we pull all the truth out and until we bring down all of these corrupt systems that have that have have been in place to discrim for, to cause discrimination and disenfranchisement for all these years, we're going to stay out here and keep fighting against it. And I think that is the right thing to do. I think that when you see what police officers have done to black people in this, and it has been hidden. For years, for generations, this stuff has been hidden, you know. Um, and you see, when you see this kind of thing on camera, you know, and, 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 and the, the sad thing about it is you shouldn't have to see it on camera. But because of the way our country was set up, we needed a camera to do anything. We needed a George Floyd to happen, to do anything about anything, you know, other than that it's going to be hidden and stuff is coming out now that happened a year ago or happened two years ago or happened six months ago that people are trying to hide. People are panicking now. People who are in these systems and responsible for this systemic racism are, they're panicking and they can't get their stuff together fast enough because, because there's enough people out here who care about doing the right thing. And so now you get all the, and, and you know, we can't do, black people can't do it without white people. We need everybody working together, you know? And so I believe this is one of the reasons why we have an opportunity because there are more and more white people who have said, you know what, this doesn't make sense. No, I don't understand what it's like to be black and I will never understand what it's like to be black, but there's something wrong with this. And, and I think that this is a real, this is a real call, <clears throat> I believe, for white people, because, you know, I get countless calls from white people saying to me, what, what, what do you think we should do? What, how can we help? You know, what, what, what's the next step, you know? And at this point, I'm saying, you know, I think the best thing you can do right now is to follow my lead. And when I need you to use your white privilege, use it you know because because you have it you know you have it and it, white privilege is a huge part of this story you know it's a huge part of this story and 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 when, when i come together with my white brothers and sisters who are what i call friends of mine i say to them look you know there's times when i'm going to need you to use your white privilege i'm going to need you to to get with some of these people that you know they have the power to, to, to change something or to do this or to do that, I'm going to need you. And at that point, I'm going to be expecting you to do it. Uh, because, because in, in our, our world, we cannot escape what it continues to happen to us. Like we can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I may have Native American in me, but people see me as a black person and I am black, you know, and so people, that, that's how I'm seen, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I, I still celebrate my Native American heritage, but I know I'm black as well. My mother's black, you know, and uh, my grandmother was Native American. So, you know, but I look at all of this and I'm saying that this is, this definitely is an opportunity 
but it's an opportunity for finally for our white brothers and sisters to look at us and say, wait a minute, the things that we were taught about black people not being smart enough, not being intellectual enough, not, um, you know, I don't know, not, not having enough, you know, resources or all, all those kinds of things. The things that we learned about black people, those are myths, you know? Like we know because we have been victims of this problem for over 400 years, we know what the, what the remedies are. We know what the answers are. That's why I always reject when people say the system is rigged, the system is broken. I always reject that. I always tell people, nope, the system is just wrong. Go back to the Constitution and you'll see that the system is just wrong. This whole situation was set up for white Anglo-Saxon men. It wasn't set up for women. It wasn't set up for blacks. It wasn't set up, you know, for minorities, you know. And so, and so we are fighting against that. We're fighting against that because it's so ingrained in everything. It's so steeped into the American life and American culture until it's so hard. It's like, it's like trying to, I don't know, it's like trying to pick out, it's, it's, uh, maybe it's like trying to uh, uh, pick hairs out of you, <laughs> gray hairs out of you. <laughs> You're trying to get the gray hairs out or something. It's like, oh, it's so, and it hurts, you know, it hurts. But it's something that we have to go through. And if we stop now, if we stop marching now, if we stop putting on pressure now, everything will go right back to where, where it was before. And we cannot afford for that to happen. We cannot afford for that to happen. So I'm, I want to say this. The opportunity that exists right now is an opportunity for our white brothers and sisters to understand that black people are more than capable. We are well capable of having the answers and we are well capable of leading this movement and telling our story and connecting that to bringing about the kind of policies and legislations that are good for everybody, for everybody. Because if you look at the history of black people, black people have been forced to be inclusive all of our lives. We've been forced to be inclusive because we've been excluded. And so we know how to bring people together. We know how to value other cultures, other ethnic groups, you know? And so this opportunity that, that exists right now, it exists for all of us. It exists for all of us. But we have to, we, we, we have to know that right now is the time for us to now begin to lay away, even black people have to lay away any myths about white people. But, but what this story is about right now is that black American experience in America that has lasted this long, you know, that has lasted this long. When I go back, when you go back to think about the Spanish Inquisition, how at, at, there were times when they really didn't understand who different people were because, you know, religion, mm -hmm. uh, and then they got into this idea of separating us by color. And, you know, I got to do more studying on that because I think it's just ridiculous. But I think, wow, what kind of human beings are we to come up with something like this? And then it turns into the slave trade. It turns into, you know, it turns into all these things that have marginalized uh, people of color for just you know for hundreds of years and so we're 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 in that place now and and i think we can i think we can do something but we have to we can't be afraid lauren we can't be afraid of the powers that be we can't be afraid to challenge them where they need to be challenged and we can't be afraid to say look the systems need to be they need to be brought down and we need to reform we need to really reform in a way where we can uh, build a country that fits with some of the ideals, some of the ideals that we talk about, you know, because some of us have never experienced, never experienced. I, I oftentimes I call myself, I've called myself the invisible man, you know, and I said, I'm the most surveilled, I'm the most surveilled 
invisible man that I know, you know, because uh, either I'm ignored through systemics or I'm being watched through sy the systemics, you know? And uh, as a person, I've been, I've been arrested, I've been put in jail, I've had guns pulled on me, you know, all of those things, you know, by police officers. And I, I also would say that all police officers are not bad, but I believe they're part of a bad system that needs to be reformed. And uh, they need to go from being police officers to peace officers. They need to understand truly what it means to um, protect and serve. Those two words mean a lot to me, protect and serve. And I would change them around and say, serve and protect. Serve and protect. And, um, and, and, and that means you don't need weapons of mass destruction. You don't need to put your knee on my neck. You, know? you, don't, need to, you, know, you don't need to do any of those kinds of things. If you see me as a human being, but if you see me as uh, some species, some different species that's dangerous to society and all those kinds of things, then you're, you don't have a problem killing me like an animal in the street, you know? And unfortunately, there's still people out there that are like that, that still hold that same, those same values. And um, so working together, we have an opportunity to, to, to crush out all of these, to, to choke out all that stuff, pull it all out. You know, and 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 if it hurts, it hurts. You know, you know if it hurts, it just hurts. But it, it, it'll it'll feel better when the operation is over. <laughs> you know, you'll feel better when we're done <laughs> cutting this stuff out because we got to cut it out. So the Holocaust Center is involved in training for City of Pittsburgh Police, and it all started at a town hall in Hazelwood back a few years ago where I met Norm Conti from Duquesne University. He's a sociology professor. And the Holocaust Center is involved to do what you're talking about. To, we talk about the Holocaust and policing during the Holocaust because that's one of the most shameful periods for policing in history, uh, where the police became the perpetrators of genocide. Mm -hmm. The point of doing that training is to talk about humanity and talk about the importance of approaching police work with humanity. And um, it's, it's a long road, but that's, that's been a good program. And um, in the wake of all these protests and criticism of the police, I hope that there remains an opportunity to do that work that we've been doing and to do it even better and to be even more effective than we've been. And uh, I feel like I always have to say this because the discussion about the police is um, essential and very important. And, um, and we work with the police and it all also comes back all the time for us to the shooting at the Tree of Life building and the police response to that, which as far as I know is the first time you really have the police coming out um, to save Jews. Because in the past it was always in the reverse. And um, we do talk about the African American experience side by side with the experience of Jews in Europe leading up to the Holocaust. Never to say this is the same thing, but to say that learning about both for each unique experience enhances our understanding of each other. Um, not ever to say one is worse than the other, but to say these are both very bad and we need to understand them and use that knowledge to see each other more clearly, to support each other more vigorously. So that's, that's where I'm coming from and I am happy as always to follow your lead. So um, what you need from me, what you need from us, please tell me um, we are there. Um, no question, we're there. Well, and I'll just say this last thing with respect to the police. Um, we have uh, uh, been building relationship with uh, guys from the number four police uh, station up there and uh, Commander Herman, uh, he's been very open to our request to, um, you know, to hook up and to learn and to talk and to express, you know, our frustrations and whatever, you know. And we actually brought a group of them to uh, Hazelwood to talk with some of our teenagers. And they took off their uniforms and they came down and they, you know, they came to us as, as just people, family, family people. And uh, they were talking about their experiences, police officers, and they took 
some really hard questions from our from our kids, you know, and um, and that was the first meeting. So the second meeting that we're going to have is going to be some role play where the police are going to be the teenagers and the teenagers are going to be the police. And so the teenagers literally have to create a system, you know, mm -hmm. that 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 the police are going to have to navigate, you know. <laughs> And so it's going to be, it's going to be different, wow. but, but it was interesting because we had about seven or eight, seven or eight, uh, officers and a, and a couple agents that came down to sit with us and, uh, male and female, you know, black and white and our students, they went, they went in on them, you know, <laughs> but, but, but they handled it. They handled it. Well, commander Herman was there with us as well. And, um, and, and, and I'll say that because uh, I like to give credit where credit is due, but I also want to say this. You know, one of the things that we, we talked about during the exhibit was how our church was a sanctuary for, for kids that were running from the law during the time they had this thing called task force. And the task force was a group of plainclothes agents that um, they had a blank check to come in and just rally up these, all these kids and take them down to, uh, to the county jail and put them in jail. But, but the problem that, that one of the problems that we had was they were taking these kids in little alleyways and beating them down. By the time we got, and these are teenagers, you know, and, and by the time we got down to the, uh, the county, these kids would be down there, they had bruises all over their faces and all messed up. So I started opening up the church and I'd bring them into church we would, we would know when task force was in the community and we'd get the word out and I'd bring them into church because they were breaking the law. The, the, the police were breaking the law by badgering, by beating down these kids. And then, you know, so what we would do, we'd bring them into church and then we'd call their parents and we'd say, your, you know, your child is here, come and get them because task force is in the neighborhood and they're looking, you know, they're sweeping, sweeping the community, you know? And, um, and those are the kind of things that happen in our communities. So that doesn't happen in Squirrel Hill. They don't sweep Squirrel Hill. You know what I mean? They don't sweep Shady Side and you know some of these places. They do sweeps through our community. And um, and and it's and it's and it's people who don't understand how what the job is really all about. You know. And so I know African American police officers who are plain clothes police officers who have had who've had situations where they were mistaken by their own colleagues for suspects, but they're, you know, they carry the shield, you know, and they have to protect themselves from the police and from the perpetrators. You know, that's, that's some crazy, that's some crazy navigation, you know, but it just goes to show you just how, you know, how difficult it can be for, for black people in so many systems, you know. There's, there is so much work to be done. And um, that perspective is one that, frankly, we don't, we don't hear often enough in the kind of detail and specificity you just shared it with us. And it's really important for people to hear that yeah. because this is part of the process of having these conversations now is listening to each other yeah. and respecting each other's experiences. So um, I, I really, I can't thank you enough for being so open and sharing that. That's, it's really important. So um, before we conclude, is there anything we didn't talk about that people should know about? Um, I'm sure there are about hours and hours of things that people should know about, but anything that we could cover <laughs> during the time that we have left? <laughs> No, I, I'll say that I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be in partnership with you uh, in, in the center. And um, I think together uh, we can keep the pressure on. Uh, and through the arts, we can, make, we can make statements, such creative statements that somebody's eyes will be open, you know. Um, we're making music down here right now. There's a lot of noise around here right now because kids are here. And, and they're making music and they're writing about COVID-19 and they're writing about the racial tension in our, in our country and, you know, everything. They're writing about all these things. And, uh, and so we're going to use art to continue to uh, put our message out there. And, and, uh, and we want to we we work together. 
maybe there's another exhibit that we do that is part of it is at your place and part of it is at our place and people will have to come to both places to see the whole story, you know? Oh, I love that idea. I saw that you recently received a prize at Center of Life for music, the Lewis Prize. The Lewis Prize, yeah. We were, we were, we were honored uh, to, to get that. Um, I think 32 organizations across the country, and we were the only ones in, uh, I think, in Pennsylvania to get it. And um, so um, we're, we're honored, we're glad. You know, we're honored, we're glad, and and the work continues, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's, like, it, it, you don't it, get it, to celebrate that off, you know, that long. <laughs> There's always more to do, that's for sure. And I won't keep you much longer. There's food to be delivered, and thank you for doing that. Food is essential, of course, and we're looking at a situation where a lot of people don't have access to it, um, and often it's because they don't drive, or they don't can have I, a car. Can, can I just say one more thing? Um, you know, Please. people have asked me, you say you, we have a fairly decent sized staff. They want to know why I'm delivering food. Mm-hmm. And I tell them, you know, for me, it, 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 it keeps me in touch with the people that I call, you know, my professors in here in the University of Hazelwood. University of Hazelwood. And, um, you know, it's not that I want to do it. It's that I believe I should do it. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't feel like I'm above, you know, pre- delivering food. You know, I think it's important. I, I think it's probably one of the most important things that I can do right now. And um, it doesn't stop me from doing all the other stuff that I do. But I'm, you know, I feel it's a, a very basic thing, like feeding, you know, or doing our best to feed. I get fed every day when I come to this community. I get fed by people and they give me things that money can't buy. The least I can do is deliver some food, you know? And um, so I'm gonna do it as long as it needs to be done. And I'll, my schedule, I'll adjust my schedule <laughs> around the, <laughs> the delivery. <laughs> uh. And, and now everyone who, who watches and listens to this program will be fed by you. So thank you so much. And um, to be continued, our work will go on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.